Great. Yeah. Hello. Welcome. I'm so happy that we uh, arranged to have an online conference and uh, can exchange our ideas on force. So that's great. I would like to talk about uh, augmenting seed force for better insight. And through the looking glass, of course, is uh, um, uh, meant to be uh, the uh, children's story uh, uh, the precursor of Alice in Wonderland. And so we would probably see some of mirrored images uh, there once in a while. Okay, so let's see uh, uh, what we're going to talk about. And uh, I have to see how to switch slides. Okay, yeah, that works. Mm, first, I will give a short introduction of the, the ideas and I will talk about seeing spaces and what that is. And um, in uh, the second part of the introduction, I will talk about monitoring and we will learn uh, about what that is. And um, uh, then uh, this is all done in the context of fourth, the new synthesis. So what we do is we look at things, dissect them, uh, try to understand the essential, and then we recombine them. And so uh, it's uh, no surprise that we will uh, want to combine seeing spaces with the idea of monitoring. And of course, there are certain considerations that you have to make many choices and uh, there is actually no real right answers on uh, some of these considerations. It all depends on the environment and the application you're looking at. After that, uh, when we learned about the considerations uh, that you uh, can do, um, we will look at a first initial attempt um, uh, to support these ideas uh, within seed force and how seed force is augmented to be able to uh, be a source in a seeing space uh, that I envision to build up at the university uh, over the next uh, years. So we will see how it comes out. Um, I will explain what I did up to now and it's all work in progress, but anyways, uh, uh, there's a short demo. I can show you some parts uh, uh, to give you some impression of what's going on and uh, maybe you can see where I'm heading at. So in the end, uh, we will have a conclusion and hopefully a very fruitful discussion. Okay, so and this is Alice and the Red Queen uh, on the right. So um, I've been discussing many things uh, with Andrew Reed within the uh, new synthesis uh, project that we are doing and also um, uh, with uh, Wolf Weigart and um, I was, uh, or we were thinking and talking about uh, the ideal uh, programming environment and uh, discussing whole on things um, uh, that uh, he uh, promotes uh, for uh, several decades already. And um, yeah, I just then said, well, um, my ideal uh, programming environment is where I can have a real immersion so I can be in the in development environment and uh, don't feel any restriction of using so information that I want to know I immediately can access and things like this. Um, and then uh, Wolf came back and said, well, do you know the work of Brad Victor? And uh, if you don't know the work of Brad Victor, I would highly recommend that you have a look at these. Um, one of his ideas is the so-called seeing space. So it's a maker space uh, that uh, well, in the maker space you do construction work, but the seeing space covers the, uh, the uh, development or uh, the, the programming uh, development side as well. So the idea is uh, you have an, a room in an environment that's uh, the seeing space. It's the ideal development space. And it's a smart environment that can capture all kinds of signals from uh, the devices, or uh, especially the devices that you're going to develop in that room uh, and uh, capture this and make it available. And uh, so there are cameras on the, uh, on, uh, on the ceiling and uh, uh, there are sensors all over the place, on the table, and, and whatever the uh, object that you're going to develop is instrumented 
uh, and it radio transmits uh, data to the room and the uh, room, the seeing space will capture all that data and store it and uh, in, a, in a way that you can later on uh, have a look at it or online interactively have a look at it. Uh, there's also screens and if you look at the pictures you see the walls are screens that display certain interesting information and um, uh, uh, camera views or time series and uh, whatever you, you can think of. And um, the idea is um, that uh, you will just um, uh, get uh, lots of knowledge uh, that is there. So as a developer, you can go and view and analyze the data to get better insight to the object that you're currently developing. So it, and it records the entire history. So something like, well, now we're observing this behavior of our object. Uh, is this something new or didn't we just pay attention uh, two hours ago? Was it there already? Uh, this could now be answered because you could, uh, it records the history. You can go back in time. You can see what happens. You can understand and analyze the data. Uh, ultimately you get inside of uh, more inside of what is being developed and if you look at how development often is done today then you have black boxes and uh, with force we really want to open that we have this interactive development and uh, can interactively inspect what's going on in the object but um, if you look at traditional engineering then uh, uh, um, people just create black boxes, um, they power them up, they don't work, uh, then they really carefully insert uh, test code uh, to make some signal uh, twiddle uh, on startup and then with the oscilloscope measure what's going on. And um, so uh, the idea is to liberate this and uh, to get something uh, more, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, in the direction of uh, the ideal development space. Of course, building such a development space is not easy at all. Um, and it's a vision. And uh, maybe uh, what I can, cont can contribute today is one tiny little step in the direction of that vision. Okay, so that's seeing spaces. And then um, I was uh, thinking of, uh, well, how do you capture data? Uh, about things. And then I uh, stumbled uh, across the notion of monitoring. We look that up in the lexicon of psychology. Monitoring is the supervision of processes. It's an umbrella term for all kinds of systematic recording, logging, measurement or observation of a process or procedure by means of technical aids or other observation systems. So it's looking at things, capturing what uh, key parameters are, uh, recording them, and uh, if you do the monitoring, of course, later on you want to look at this. And uh, that's not computer or engineering uh, uh, centric uh, at all. Many uh, uh, areas use this, so environmental protection or meteorology, climatology, epidemiology, uh, oceanography, and others, they just use the monitoring, uh, uh, measure data over time uh, and uh, uh, try to get um, ideas uh, and insight from, from this data. Yeah? In technology, we mainly use this for providing safety, like intrusion detection, for example, or, or some um, uh, even, even the constant monitoring uh, in a car with, uh, with, for the airbag. Um, uh, is uh, uh, for safety and uh, to prevent any incidents. So uh, that's uh, uh, the, the current focus, not on development. Yeah? And uh, so monitoring is for getting insights and supervised processes. Yeah? And if we look at um, uh, IT, yeah, then uh, uh, we can look at large, large business environments um, uh, that run in, uh, in the cloud or uh, Gerald would say in the cluster. Uh, and these uh, business environments typically have a additional separate orthogonal infrastructure that is used for monitoring all the components yeah, to ensure a continuous uh, operation and uh, 
reliability and availability and, and things like this. Yeah? And uh, the monitoring system will collect data from different systems and there are um, different things that you can think of. Either the system can directly um, uh, emit uh, the appropriate monitoring information without an agent um, uh, or it needs to have some additional process to set up and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, prepare the data so it's injected in the monitoring system. So we have these system one and system two that are in one or, or the other notion. Uh, the monitoring system itself does health checks, so it uh, checks if there's a heartbeat, for example, and if a system goes down, most likely the heartbeat uh, stops and uh, um, the monitoring system can detect this, can make an uh, uh, alert and uh, 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 issue restarts or failover or whatever uh, is, is required. Okay, all this data is collected in the monitoring storage, it's visualized um, and um, it's uh, prepared uh, for humans to look at. Uh, you can have rules in there to uh, automatic uh, react on certain situations and things like this. Um, and uh, the monitoring storage can be used for all the um, uh, analytic things uh, that uh, are typically done in business, like business intelligence or intrusion detection, or yeah, you do big data analyt uh, analytics, or you could have machine learning algorithms that uh, look at this, classify or estimate things uh, and, and things like this. So uh, what people are doing there is uh, they uh, record the history, they go back in time to see what happened, uh, try to understand what's going on and get insight into the business environments. Well, um, that sounds quite uh, similar uh, in, in the net effect uh, of, of what a seeing space is supposed to do. And the idea is now uh, to um, use that technology, uh, uh, a seeing space uh, 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 and support uh, monitor, use monitoring to support a seeing space. So uh, we're not looking at business infrastructure anymore, uh, but uh, well, uh, let's call it uh, IoT devices. Yeah? And uh, let's just call it devices, which we are programming in force since ages. And if it's a connected device, uh, then it could uh, su uh, submit uh, log messages also into a uh, mon monitoring system. And uh, then you get uh, hopefully insights into uh, the appropriate uh, device as well. So health information, is it still working? Uh, uh, um, is it critical? What is the temperature of the device? Uh, and also memory consumption or whatever you can think of. Um, uh, could be made available by a uh, monitoring system to the user. And uh, down uh, at the uh, analytics side, we need to have some seeing space uh, looking glass uh, where we can just observe uh, what's going on with the IoT device. Whether or not we need the traditional systems in the setup or if we uh, end up with a specialized system uh, that uh, needs to be found out. Yeah. The idea here is it's not just during operation, but now maybe we can uh, also do the monitoring uh, during development. Mm, uh, uh, it's best if we can do this in real time. So the system measures something, we can immediately see what's going on and that it's interactive. So the seeing space should allow us to easily build up the view to the system that we want to have. Um, let me note that uh, this monitoring capability is something that is in addition to the proper action, uh, uh, the actual task that uh, the de device uh, is, is supposed to do. And so we, we have to build it in, in addition to the, um, to, uh, to the task that the device is intended to do. Uh, and to do this, we have to build it in by design. So we have to have larger uh, hardware that it can also do the monitoring. Um, and it's not just uh, uh, as narrow and uh, so that it's just about capable of, of doing the task. So, so we have this, this additional thing. 
Okay, so, uh, and what we want to do this with this is we want to record the history of the device, uh, go back in time, see what happened, understand and get insight. Um, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, and there are several uh, monitoring system, of course, uh, out in the field uh, because they are uh, focused to business uh, applications. They are huge, uh, but they will run on the um, on the infrastructure anyways, uh, in the cloud or in the cluster, and allow us to do uh, some things. Right. Okay. Um, if you want to do this, have a device that. Uh, 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 delivers some uh, monitoring information, log messages, uh, you can also call it log messages, um, then you have many things uh, to consider. Um, uh, you have to uh, design uh, the monitoring capability in addition to the actual task. And um, of course, it's necessary that uh, the monitoring does not impact the, this actual task. The device initial purpose is to fulfill the actual task. And if the monitoring interferes with it, then that's bad. Does not interfere at all is impossible, which Werner Heisenberg actually uh, showed. So uh, we must weaken that and say uh, it must uh, uh, impact uh, the device actual task the, the least possible. Yeah? Um, and yeah, so we have to, have to ask us some questions. What to, do we want to monitor? Um, and uh, uh, if we send log messages, do we send them in uh, text form or as binary? Do we pack the binary to a safe bandwidth? Um, does the application send the log messages directly or is there a background task that does this? So it's just uh, delivered to some mailbox uh, without impacting the foreground task that does the actual uh, task um, at all uh, and uh, uh, lowers uh, the, the time necessary to transmit or prepare the log messages. Um, do we submit the messages directly or via an agent, uh, as we saw in the, in the graphic? Um, is there a shared uh, communication channel, some serial line or uh, field bus interface that is already used uh, and the information uh, of the log message is uh, used that way? Or do we have dedicated communication channel um, uh, to uh, send the messages? Do we want this buffered or unbuffered, persistent, not persistent? So many, many, many questions that you answer and uh, need to answer eventually for a, a single device and uh, a single application. And uh, there's no true or false answer. Use this or that, and uh, this combination is the right one. Everything else is false. Uh, it really depends on the application needs and the, in, on the available infrastructure that, uh, that you have. You don't have to see. Okay. Um, what do we want to monitor in a device? Yeah, of course, if the device measures some sensor data, that's interesting. Yeah? So we see either the raw measured data or uh, if we have some filters or fusion or whatever uh, data streams that uh, appear in between. That's what we want to capture and uh, um, uh, put in the monitoring information. Often we design uh, devices in a way that uh, there's some kind of state machine in there. Could be a finite state machine, but even if you look at the, uh, the amount of data structures that you have, the values of variables and so on could be considered a state. And if the system does a state change, that's really interesting to know as an engineer. And you want to know this and put this in the, um, uh, in the log messages so that you know what's going on. You want to know where uh, the program is executing and things like this, of course. Um, application parameters. Uh, what is the reaction time latency that we have? Uh, um, what is the memory consumption? Yeah. So then we can see, oh, wow, uh, after some uh, amount of time, uh, the, the device is operating for some while, we see the memory fills up. We have a memory leak there somewhere. Uh, we can observe this uh, uh, from the seeing room. Uh, of course, device parameters like operating temperature, uh, utilization, uh, 
yeah, um, yeah, are there situations where the CPU is overloaded and things like this? Uh, well, I, I mean, I have the monitor uh, for the laptop running all the time because I want to know what's going on um, and uh, so things like this. Um, if uh, the, the application uh, managed to uh, uh, do certain actions successfully, we want to know about this uh, usage statistics and things like this. Uh, user input, maybe if it's an I.O. device or whatever. If the program, uh, the application program has errors, uh, signals, errors, failures, uh, um, then we want to know about that. And if the system restarts because a watchdog trigger or whatever safety con uh, measures you, you do, we want to know this in the log so that we get a very precise um, detailed picture of what the device is actually doing. And uh, maybe you think uh, it's too much data that is stored, but storage is actually cheap. Bandwidth is a consideration and you have to think about that, of course, um, if uh, the, the, the application or the device only delivers a temperature where you once in a while, then it's no use if you have a hundred thousand uh, times more monitoring data. Of course, you have to be reasonable at that point. Uh, but uh, the more you get, the more you can learn about uh, the device operation. Okay, so let's uh, see uh, how uh, I augmented SeedForce uh, to support this. So SeedForce is the force system that uh, uh, is developed out of the uh, new synthesis uh, project. And uh, we are uh, still looking at uh, many different aspects of what uh, makes up force. Um, and uh, I've been reporting about this along with uh, Andrew over the last years. And uh, uh, there are still areas that we explore in new uh, and uh, that we can continue to talk about. So uh, what uh, do we want to have in the force system? Of course, if we want to uh, submit log messages, then it should, should be easy. Uh, yesterday, uh, Bernd said, well, force is about building domain-specific language that solve the appropriate task uh, in an, uh, in an uh, uh, appropriate way and that are easy to implement. Yeah? And, uh, so uh, we need to have some kind of log messages, uh, domain-specific language. In addition, we want to have uh, a system integration of the logging. So we want to switch on logging on uh, specific parts of the system. Uh, if we have words, maybe on entry or exit of a word, because then it's automatically captured that certain functionality is put on. You don't want to trace every word, um, but um, uh, for certain key uh, points in your application, that's reasonable. Of course, if uh, an application throws uh, 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 errors, uh, then uh, we want to know that. Um, and uh, so it would be nice if throw can just do it. And we want to have access to system parameters, like what is the stack depth, what is the memory usage, and um, other parameters that might be useful uh, to know um, to make the system reliable. And um, what we also want to do is, of course, uh, we want to have a timestamp on every log entry so that we can uh, order them by uh, date. Uh, and hopefully, uh, this uh, gives us also a uh, causal order uh, so we can uh, order them by course and, uh, and uh, action. Um, uh, we want to know what kind of event has been uh, has taken place, and uh, within the logging world, it's very reasonable to have uh, so-called severity or log level, uh, so that you can say, okay, there are informational messages and there are important messages, and uh, I want to tweak this and maybe only look at the warnings uh, at some point in time and the errors and uh, not at the debugging and information messages that, that uh, are submitted. Right, and um, so 
Uh, the logging system is uh, quite an easy way to do. I decided to go for a binary representation here, but the interface should be uh, the same. Uh, so um, there's the defining word severity, and severity defines uh, uh, the, the different log levels, debug trace, info one, error, and fatal. And uh, this is the way I'm doing uh, enumerations uh, uh, right now, but you can hide it in severity if you want to. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so this gives you uh, these uh, uh, severity words, and then you can use it, as you can see down there, uh, you can say uh, something like 25 number temperature info, and this creates and somehow submits uh, the appropriate log uh, entry. Now, or you say, with having some previously uh, captured uh, ticks on the stack, you say ticks swap minus number time spent trace uh, to put uh, out an appropriate uh, log message for some duration uh, that you measured uh, in your application. Um, the time temperature, time spent are just also enumerations, uh, uh, so you get the appropriate binary representation for free. Okay. So uh, I think that's uh, a quite nice uh, way to, to prepare the logs. Um, there is no way to uh, write arbitrary strings as log messages. So you have to think about uh, the uh, events uh, that, uh, uh, that, that you want to uh, log. Uh, you can uh, use the appropriate severities uh, and uh, you can have additional data uh, along with this. And uh, the severity words uh, will uh, add uh, the timestamp, the stack depth, the origin of the log message to the log message and output it, it appropriately. And um, right. And uh, so let's see. Um, and then we also want to add uh, uh, the logging system capability to, uh, to, to the system level. So the outer interpreter is augmented uh, so that it sends out appropriate info messages um, so that you can later on see maybe did I had this kind of error uh, at an earlier stage already or not. If you're in a heavy debugging uh, session, then it might be that you doubt your memory and see, ah, did I see it exactly that way or was it in a different way? Um, and if uh, this is captured, uh, then that's fine. Maybe you also want to capture the history, but that's not what I'm currently doing. And of course, throw is extended. So if you have non-zero throw codes, then it will just uh, also um, uh, do a uh, appropriate log entry uh, that, that you can see. And uh, in gray, not implemented, but easy to do, um, you, know, you can uh, put uh, appropriate logging and allocate and free. And uh, so, so you get uh, memory statistics and, uh, uh, and uh, maybe you can uh, understand your memory issues uh, by looking at the logs and analyzing them uh, later on. Or uh, if you have an appropriate um, indicator in uh, your seeing space, uh, you can uh, see them uh, early up front. So who knows? Right. Um, so what's going on? Uh -huh. um, yeah, and then uh, very often you want to know uh, at which word uh, uh, a, a specific log message is initiated. And uh, so you want to switch on and off uh, creating of uh, log records on entry of a word uh, and on exit of the word, maybe along with the topmost element so that you can have a look at it and uh, decide uh, later on if that, that's uh, reasonable or uh, that's also already a cause of an error also. So you can think of tracing, uh, but also with log messages or only the log messages. Um, uh, so that's, uh, 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 yeah, uh, that's of your choice. So if we have uh, uh, the factorial function in uh, uh, the recursive form, uh, well, I'm computer scientist, and so uh, this is often used for, uh, playing around, um, then uh, the syntax I came up with, if you want to have uh, uh, this function be traceable, you just put a star in front of the initial uh, stack comment parentheses. 
Yeah, so instead of parent and then stack comment, you just star parent and uh, you just star it. And then you can switch on and off uh, um, uh, the tracing. Of course, you can also go and patch uh, code uh, to uh, do uh, tracing. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's only one option of uh, what can be done. And so if you then uh, uh, run uh, three uh, uh, fact here, then it will give you this kind of trace, uh, show you the stack, and uh, will um, uh, also show the recursive descent and then the recursive uh, um, uh, going to the surface again and then uh, doing the appropriate calculation there. So you get some insight in the uh, factorial function by, by that. And now I'm talking about log messages. So in addition, uh, the system uh, is supposed to also log data. And uh, the log records are long, and so I only uh, captured the right part of them. Uh, but you can see uh, uh, the data is the topmost item, and it goes from three, two, one, zero, and then it goes, uh, as this is the uh, anchor case, uh, from one to, to six. And uh, so you can learn about uh, what's going on. And uh, actually, uh, the first column, the where, is the magical number where the invocation actually takes place. And I see here we have two numbers, uh, 37723 and uh, uh, the other one. And that's uh, because of uh, my capturing, uh, we'll, do, uh, we'll get the execute in the, in the uh, in the outer interpreter first. But um, you get the idea uh, where should signal where the log messages come from, actually. Uh, it's enter, 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 exit, exit, exit. Uh, so that's uh, uh, at the beginning and at the end of the um, uh, factorial function. And uh, the last line actually is, is the execute uh, in, in the outer interpreter. OK, so. Let's see that in action. Uh, but before that, we will have a look at the infrastructure that uh, we, uh, I will show you in just a moment. So we have the Seedforce system that is just an interactive uh, text interpreting system right now. Well, I had to better have written Seedforce interactive because Seedforce normally operates on tokenized source code, but um, the, this is the uh, text variant Seedforce interactive. It sends out encoded log messages, uh, and there's an agent that captures these log messages and prepares them uh, uh, and creates the JSON format. Uh, this runs on a, on a host computer, um, uh, so uh, it's uh, not uh, influencing with the, uh, with the device, uh, with the Seedforce application. Um, and uh, the agent then uh, writes out a log file with JSON records. Uh, very, very uh, contemporary. And then there's a node red system that observes the log file, and sees that the new lines are written there, and uh, uh, takes them and uh, appropriate builds up a dashboard uh, with a web UI that you can then uh, have a look at. Yeah. And uh, so now is the time that we look at the demo. And let's see if I can manage to do that. Uh, put that over there. Ah, right. And uh, then, uh, oh, that's not good. Let's see. Yeah. So, and then uh, uh, in the lower part, Seedforce is running. And um, uh, in the top part, we have uh, the dashboard that uh, Node-RED actually produces. And if I'm now doing just enter, you see that new records are uh, added uh, to uh, the log uh, part below. Uh, we have in the middle part uh, information about the log levels that uh, uh, took place. And then the top part um, looks at the stack and the return stack uh, with uh, uh, levels uh, at the left and with uh, time series uh, or event series, I must say, uh, on, on the right. And, and uh, so if I just put items on the stack, yeah, you see that uh, the level uh, just goes up. And uh, if I'm doing calculation, then it just go, goes down. So I can see how the stack changes uh, over time. And, uh, 
and the appropriate records are uh, at the bottom. And if I'm now doing something strange, uh, then uh, uh, it's supposed to uh, make things red uh, there. Yeah, there it is. Or another time. And then if you see, yeah, you can see, ah, oh, there was an error uh, a couple of uh, seconds ago, uh, 17, 14, uh, more or less uh, my local time here, which is 1500 uh, uh, universal time. Um, and uh, of course you can tweak this. Uh, so it displays always uh, universal time uh, to do this. So, and now what I can do is I can just run uh, uh, the factorial function. And uh, yeah, this is what happens uh, once in a while. The, the system itself seems to be flaky right now it doesn't capture all the events and uh, let's see ah here we go um, uh, that uh, you can see uh, the blue uh, messages uh, are enter and exit messages and um, then you can see if you call the factorial function it goes up uh, and also the return state goes up and then eventually um, you hit the anchor case and you do the calculation and you'll go down uh, and you can see what's going on. And of course, if you do uh, now something like uh, a strange loop, I will see, uh, oh, no, I, I won't press the system, I believe. Um, uh, well, we, 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 can, uh, we can actually say, uh, I, I will do this uh, and then we will stop uh, um, with the demonstration. Um, uh, I'll say dope uh, again. something like this. And uh, if I'm doing test now, boom. Ah, yeah, it's uh, okay. Uh, it faster, uh, it faster crashed and uh, it was able to output some uh, more information. Um, right. Okay. So here we go. Uh, some uh, information messages on startup. Um, well, I think uh, you get the idea and we, we can discuss the details uh, later on. And uh, so uh, let's see how we do this uh, short demo. And uh, of course, this is all open ended. Uh, you can tweak uh, the messages that you send or you can tweak the dashboard and see what's going on. You can debug why certain uh, lines, uh, uh, log lines are not detected by the node dashboard. Um, uh, they are actually in the log file, but uh, I couldn't figure out why uh, uh, node red wouldn't uh, detect them. Um, anyway, um, so come to, coming to my conclusion and hopefully we'll have a good discussion afterwards is uh, I think that monitoring devices can give a very good insight in their working and uh, especially during development. And it's not that you're uh, want to develop with eyes closed uh, and with black boxes, you want to know as much as possible about the system that is there. So during development, I think it's uh, rather important. And later in the field, of course, if, and if we have a situation that is similar to uh, what Nick just said, uh, we can't really test uh, the things uh, on the bench. Uh, we had to go in the field still it's interesting to see uh, what are the parameters that uh, the devices go through and uh, what, what is important to um, make things reliable and, uh, um, and uh, make them of high quality. By this you need to have monitoring by design. It's not sufficient that you just have some piece of hardware that can barely do the actual task at hand and then add monitoring later. It, uh, will not be uh, able to do both. So you have to build in monitoring right from the beginning, but I'm convinced that if you do this and with the cheap hardware that is available, you can really afford this, um, put some special monitoring computer by uh, side of the device and uh, uh, capture what's going on. You can even think of uh, Raspberry Pi hats that capture the data uh, and uh, um, so you get even traces of the IO pins uh, moving around and in the spirit of a logic analyzer or things like this. So what I've been talking about is a technical approach to seeing spaces. The things that Brett Victor actually is doing is more for non-technical people 
um, with a very um, new interface where uh, you have sheets of paper uh, uh, on the desk and the camera sees and detects what's going on and you have markers uh, that you push around to interact with the system. Um, my point of view is more uh, it's for engineers, for, for developers and they bring some kind of uh, technical knowledge hopefully with them and uh, so uh, they are able to uh, also configure the seeing space uh, in some way. The business intelligence uh, or the business monitoring solutions uh, could be very difficult to use and to set up, um, uh, but uh, the node red is uh, fairly simple to use. Uh, and so if the issues are uh, identified, um, then I will uh, probably go ahead and uh, go with that uh, uh, further on. Okay, yeah, that's uh, my conclusion. Thank you very much for listening and I'm open for your questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Andrew. So um, a, a very brief observation in the form of an anecdote and then a, a question in your, your response to Lily. You were talking about business monitoring. Uh, we have that in our business. And actually, we found out recently that it's costing quite a lot of money because they've got special servers just for monitoring. Um, and well, that was interesting. But what was more interesting is we found out the IT team ignored all monitoring data because they were far too busy. And the reports, it was just it was just like a dot matrix printer that had, that had gone crazy. Things piling off every month, they, it's, it's as much as they could do to throw away the monitoring emails which come in. And so we said to the vendor who runs our data center, well, we, we're just a very small customer of a big data center, but our, our little piece of it, can you set up this monitoring software so it tells us when something important happens but doesn't swamp us with meaningless lists of people logging in and out and files swapped and opened and closed? And they said, well, no, no, you've got to tell us what you're interested in. And I said, oh, I'm interested when something dangerous happens on the file system. I'm interested when something abnormal is happening. I'm interested when something. And they said, no, that, that, that isn't, you know, you've got to tell us what you really mean by interesting or abnormal. And it, it became quite a pointless discussion where they said, well, you've got to tell us what you want. And that's got to be specified in some technical language, which, and there was no, and, and, <laughs> huge disconnect and, and eventually we said is there anything off the shelf surely we're not the only people who just want to know if the file system's safe isn't it hasn't anybody solved the problem of just alert the right people when something odd happens to the file system well not not really we can tell you any file was copied swapped deleted and it can actually could actually take three hours to run a trace on some of these files that are open and closed you know hundreds of times a day um but we never solved it and so we're still logging and, and there's absolutely no useful management information coming out of that whatsoever. So I don't know, I, it, is that solved? I mean, what's your reaction to that kind of thing, um, Ali? Uh, I would say it's probably not completely solved, but uh, there's a huge branch in data science uh, uh, slash machine learning uh, that deals with anomaly detection. So it captures the normal operation and it learns about um, how loads uh, goes up and down and what user, uh, uh, how many files uh, he or she accesses uh, in what area and so on and builds up uh, the notion of normality. And uh, then once mm -hmm. uh, this has been trained or, or there's also ideas or, or, or systems that do continuous training, um, once this has been trained, it can trigger abnormal behavior. So if normally I'm just coming in uh, at 10 in the morning and uh, uh, then accessing my email and doing file, uh, then that's the no uh, and this is the normal case. And all of a sudden I'm coming in six in the morning on a Monday morning and copy huge of files to my mm. local computer. Then this would raise an alert. Uh, and um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know about any commercial systems that do things like this, but uh, I know this is a branch uh, of research right now. And I know that uh, companies in Germany developed um, 
intrusion detection uh, mechanism. So it's a, it's a uh, uh, for, for, uh, supplier for current. Uh, and he says, well, we have a website, we have personal information from our customers, and we have to do intrusion detection on our network because uh, uh, there are so many data breaches uh, in uh, support companies. Uh, and we are ruined if this happens to us uh, because we are just a small one. And uh, so if, if we can't protect our customers' data, then uh, uh, it's bad for us. So they invested really in uh, building up a, uh, uh, intrusion detection, anomaly detection system for their network. Uh, I would like to add something to this. There mm -hmm. are now commercial uh, and also open software projects ah. which do this especially in the cluster world. I can look them up for you if you want, because what they do, you just supply them with the raw input or as Uli's mm -hmm. input with JSON, they also like that. And then you just tell them what periods are normal for you and what are unexpected. And actually, when you're using a software that they already know, they can automatically then tell you what's wrong. So, and they will then even trigger alerts. So the system will be a bit loud at the beginning. But as Uli said, it, it's done normally with machine learning. And it's actually, mm -hmm. it, it's so far uh, simplified that you, you can now use it by yourself in a cluster easily. So you would put it between Proteus and Grafana if that means something to you. Interesting, thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Nick, if you want to say something, enable your mic. Oh yeah, I was just, uh wanted to ask Uli actually uh, how he stores all this data and whether this store is an unlimited or a sort of circular buffer or... So uh, currently the device... Oh, yeah, now you have to mute it again, so because I'm getting an echo. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. Um, um, currently it's uh, captured and stored just in a file. There is no log rotation, but the typical setup is uh, it will be transmitted to a dedicated server that deals with the, with the, with the logs and uh, um, condense them maybe, or even uh, upload them in the cloud. And uh, there, there they live, well, uh, I would say forever, depending on the amount of data that you produce. But if it's uh, terabytes, then that's not an issue. You just upload the data. And of course, accessing then in an appropriate way requires a cluster to do this, and uh, uh, and then then things get great. Yeah. So no no rotation. The the idea is to capture all information, so that you can later revise it. You, you the the idea is not to throw away information. Maybe condense them in some way, but uh, for later reference, you want to capture them. And, uh, and of course, you need to have some kind of graphical interface or some uh, way to actually do it. Uh, and I think, uh, did you say Grafana right now, uh, Gerald? Uh, it has the capability of going back in time and then zoom into the events a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago and uh, to see what uh, happened at that time. And then also do... Uh, Com combination and analysis on parts of it and uh, things like that. Does this answer your Nick question? Has, uh, Nick has another question. Please um, unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I was just interested there because um, you were suggesting actually putting all the data onto a database, basically. But what we found is um, if you uh, accumulating large quantities of data and you really don't want to invoke uh, Mr. Heisenberg, um, you've really got to use some something that works a bit more quickly than a database. And we actually mm -hmm. use Netlog for this. Mm -hmm. But what, what I really liked was your graphical display there because you end up with an enormous Z-log file and actually locating the more serious um, little comments which are put onto Z-log is actually it's actually quite a job. So your idea there of presenting this as a color graphical thing, I think is a really, really lovely idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, the, the other thing I just wondered about, uh, Uli, was um, um, 
And when you are um, calling a logging function there, do you actually um, make the log message up um, during um, compilation time or execution time? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the log message is created uh, at execution time, but it's only binary data. So it's it's uh, 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 or it can be only a binary data. So there's no need uh, to actually uh, uh, concatenate strings or things like this. Uh, so you build up the record and then the record is submitted. And as for storing the data in the database, of course, uh, if you're using MySQL or whatever and uh, on on some some uh, uh, local computer, then. Uh, uh, you might be able to fill it up completely and then it slows down. And if you are doing things synchronously, so you have to wait until the database really um, stores the data or commits it even, um, then uh, this would slow down your application a lot. So then you need to have buffering. If that's an issue for you, then you need to have buffering so that the application can say, this is the record, go away. And then uh, I'll send it away and then it can uh, work on its actual task uh, again. Um, and you can bring this down to uh, only a couple of um, uh, microseconds probably. Take it, transmit it. Uh, maybe you have to use some, uh, some bus protocol or some, some, some external channel, uh, maybe a CAN bus where you just throw in it, uh, the data to the controller and then you, you're uh, done. So it's essentially eight bytes store and uh, uh, that, that could be it. And uh, so, so, yeah, depending on your needs, you can bring this down uh, a lot. And of course, if you want to store huge amounts of data, you have to have a distributed database in some place. Um, so time is running out, but uh, Bernd had a question. So if it's a short one, please unmute yourself. Uh, when you do simulation of hardware, like Verilog or VHDL, <laughs> you often have a waveform viewer for the signals you get out of this uh, monitoring of your simulated device and attaching a waveform viewer to a force system would be cool too, I think. Mm -hmm. But you need to figure out which format to use to get that into the waveform viewers. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. But because they don't read JSON. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just use JSON because, uh, um, yeah, so so the, the, the agent actually takes the binary representation that the force system emits and then, mm -hmm. um, uh, and then uh, produces the JSON. So because I knew that Node-RED can deal with that. And, uh, but it could be anything. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a transformation step in between. And the agent is supposed to work asynchronously with the, with mm. the device. Uh, so, with the yeah, buffer so you can the adapt the agent to talk to some waveform viewer program. Sure, sure. I think Uli's yeah. uh, tool chain is very good with Node-RED in between. You can quickly adopt it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Node-RED is for the analyzing part and, and the idea. Uh, I always uh, I also was thinking about capturing devices. So there's, for example, there's the small board called Bus Pirate ah, yeah, um, yeah. That, that you can just attach to. Uh, there's I2C I or there's SPI and you just hook on something like similar to a logic analyzer, but for communication protocols. And then you can integrate this as well. Uh, have a camera on top uh, so that you try to capture all the information that is necessary. Yeah. All right. So this, if... this is a really interesting subject. Could I suggest to uh, uh, Gerald, perhaps, is it that we could maybe have a, a breakout discussion on this later sure, in the conference sure. or something like that? Uh, yeah. Well, there's actually a break now. So my uh, my thinking would be that sorry Gerald makes a makes a breakout room right now and uh, so you can talk to the presenters in the breakout room 